Welcome to Book and Lounge. I'm your host, Jacqueline. Before we get into this episode, I just want to say thank you so much to the book club members and to our guests who give up their time freely so we can bring you this podcast. I also want to say thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy the podcast, please hit subscribe and leave us a comment or a review. Today's episode, we are discussing the Book of Memory by Patina Gapar. Let's join the conversation. I am joined by Katrina, Annette and Taiwo from the Afro-Caribbean Book Club. And the book that we're discussing today is the Book of Memory by Patina Gapar. First of all, welcome back, guys. How are you? We're fine. Okay, Hi, thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, this is a really interesting book and I absolutely enjoyed it. And so the story is narrated by an Albina woman. Her name is Memory. She's telling her story in form of a journal that she's keeping for a journalist. And she's writing this story from Maximum Security Prison in Zimbabwe, where she's basically waiting for a death sentence. She's been convicted for murdering her adopted father. And in the recollection, she's basically writing about her life from when she was young up until the day she finds herself in prison. Now, first of all, I just want to know what you guys thought of the book. Anybody want to jump and go first? Did you like it? Was it gripping? Did you not like it? I loved it. it? Yeah, I liked it very much. I enjoyed it a lot. I thought it was good. Okay. (laughs) A bit of hesitation from you there, Annette. I like this book. I like... The fact that it's written from an albino woman's perspective, you don't see that very often. And I also like the fact that it's set in a prison. I mean, again, it's not very often that I read a book about black women, especially a prison in Africa. I was gripped um, because of that. So first of all, then, coming back to you guys, what was your initial reaction to the book? Did it hook you immediately or did it take some time to get into? Katrina? No, it gripped me immediately, really. But that's Partly because I've got some links with Zimbabwe, so I was very keen. (laughs) And the beginning, it starts with this sort of, in the first sentences that her parents had sold her, which doesn't sound typical of Zimbabwe. So that made me curious. What I never thought that was the real story. Okay. And how about you, Taiwo? What do you think of Min was where you immediately taken in, seeing as you really loved it? Yeah, I loved it right from the get-go. And for me, it was a complete story. It had all the elements of, you know, the kind of angst that she was feeling and maybe some elements of regret looking back at her life. I liked the way in which there was humour throughout the whole story. There was this thread of humour um, running through it because I guess she could she could see the guards for what they were and their kind of petty tyrannies and the way they behaved with the power that they held over the inmates. And she could also see the inmates and their backstories, you know, what, you know, decisions that they made and actions that they took that eventually led them to be in the prison in the first place. So also the fact that the way in which the the book goes from her being a child to her then being a very well-educated adult, well-traveled and so on, you know, it's the kind of development of the girl to the woman. Mm. I like that as well. Okay. So, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And the book cover, I loved it. What cover do you have? Can you show it? I've got the one with the albino woman in profile, and mm-hmm. she's got the black and white butterflies. Uh-huh. And part of the book talks about the whole issue of environmental damage. I think it was a certain species of butterfly that when the local factories were producing a lot of soot, the black butterfly flourished because it used the soot as kind of camouflage uh-huh. because it was a dark butterfly. So the, the white butterfly of that particular species was easily identified by birds or whatever and eaten. And then when the factories closed down or whatever, then the reverse happened. So, yeah, that's kind of a play on the whole issue of skin pigmentation or the lack of that's interesting. I didn't think about the butterflies that way. How about yeah. the pet? What did you think? Um, I thought it was good. I don't know if it immediately gripped me at the beginning, but it was an easy read. Like I didn't want. It sounds like if I didn't want to stop, it did hold me. Like it did grip me, but it wasn't necessarily that. It was just I was enjoying it as I went along, and I did like all the kind of backstories in between of the other prisoners and the personalities of the prison guards. I think for me, I still it took a while to get to 
what I wanted to know. And so as much as everything else was quite interesting, I remember I always haven't been able to reread the book again, but even I've kind of just read random chapters and one chapter towards the end I was reading where I thought it would be past a certain point. She's actually talking about still about her childhood growing up in the house. I was like, okay, like that's great. But why is towards the end of the book, why has this come up again? So that sort of those aspects kind of irritated me a little bit. I guess she's in a prison she was in her own mind a lot and she's writing a journal so that makes sense I understand that but I think there was there was just some parts where I didn't think it was fully necessary and it could have just got to what we what we wanted to know but it was still good overall just a bit of jumping a bit too much jumping for me yeah so coming back to what you just said then about the structure well for me first of all I find found it quite slow uh, to begin with and then towards the end, I think after the second uh, the second book, that's when I was really gripped and that's when I really like, started getting into it. But the beginning bit I found quite slow. But coming back to the structures, the author, because it's memory telling her story, she does flick back and forth and jumps to different parts of her life as she's telling the, retelling the story. And I just wondered how that affected your reading or enjoyment of the story, or if, if it did affect it at all. Um, I think I got used to it to a point. So I was like, okay, here we've gone back to like a part of the past again. But it would sometimes be frustrating for me where I think we're getting to a certain point where something's about to happen and then the next chapter or just a couple of pages would be about something again in the past. And so sometimes I felt it was a little bit disruptive, but mm-hmm. I kind of gotten used to how she was writing. So I was like, well, it is what it is. But I don't know. I don't think I liked it that much the way that it was written. It, yeah, it was sort of good story, so I was able to see past it. How about you, Tyler? What did you think about the structure? It didn't really affect me either way, because part one, when it talks about, I'm not sure whether it's Mara Para or whether it's Hara Para. I think uh, it means some kind of antelope. Okay, so part one was really about her childhood, her beginnings, maybe an origins story. And then part two was Summer Madness, which is, you know, when she's coming into adulthood and she's talking about living with Lloyd. Yeah. And then part three is more to do with the prison, I guess. So for me, it wasn't a problem kind of going back and forth. I found maybe more some of the Zimbabwean words more difficult because I used to read them, even though I couldn't understand what it meant. I struggled reading them because the, the way the letters kind of, it didn't flow naturally to me because I'm not, maybe I'm not familiar with that part of the world. And what, what did everybody else think about the Shona? There's a lot of Shona in this book. I think it's one of the books where I've seen the most foreign, foreign language, where the author has written the most foreign language, or the most in foreign languages, and then not translated it. And I just wondered what everybody else thought about that. I would have been pissed off if she had translated it. I would have been pissed off. I agree, but at the same time, sometimes I struggle to, because sometimes I can get around the context of what it probably meant. But in some of this, I was like, I actually have no idea what, what they could have said so yeah i would have been annoyed if she had translated it but at the same time i needed help so i don't know (laughs) what to do um yeah i think there could have been a a balance but it's fine i'd rather i guess she didn't i suppose but some some of it i just didn't understand what could have been said at all i think yeah i thought it was good that she didn't explain but at the same time i wasn't that invested that i would google some of the expressions to work out what is this? You know, what what exactly does it mean? You probably won't get them anyway, because I yes. didn't. Because I could, well, I wondered what you guys would say, because I read someone else's review that they found it was annoying. The bits that I did understand, actually, I found were mostly, actually, the context of the story was exactly what was being said in the show now. <laughs> so it, it didn't really lose anything. There are a few bits where... It's like children's nursery rhyme type of things that, I mean, I think they'd probably be nonsense anyway, but I I wouldn't know what they meant. I liked it because I sort of liked to see how much I actually could understand, which wasn't all that much, but a little bit. Uh-huh. But that's part of why the first part in um, Marapara Street, I did like it because it, you know, it brought back a lot of memories. I thought to me it was very reflective of things I'd seen in Zimbabwe, although I don't know Harare, but other big towns. And um, and and she says, I noticed that she says it was the 80s, and the first time I went was in 1984. So, you know, her childhood would kind of match up with the first times when I was in Zimbabwe. So I found that 
and the language that it just went all together for me. Yeah. So it's interesting that the author herself, when she was asked about this, she basically said that she's more willing to take the risk that the reader will fail to understand something and lose the reader than put in a show in a word and then try and explain it. I did not try looking up any of the words at all. And I didn't actually think that it took anything away from my understanding of the the whole story. If anything, I thought that um, having the Sharina words actually gave it a sense of place. That with the with her old whole descript, colorful description of what the place she was describing was like, that taken together with the language gave me a sense of place and actually made me visualize the streets that she was writing about a bit better and also the people a bit better. I definitely agree with you guys. I don't think that it should have been translated. Yeah, definitely. Don't explain. And so the, 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 coming back to memory, well, there's a play on memory, the word memory itself, first of all. The protagonist is called memory. The story is based on her recollection of events that have happened in, in her life. And I just wanted to explore this whole idea of memory. First of all, is memory a credible narrator, given as she's re recollecting some of these events quite some time after they happened? Do you think that she's a credible narrator? And secondly, I just wanted to explore this again, memory again, with the fact that is memory ever reliable? Can we have memory superimposed on us by the things that people say to us? Because if they say it long enough, I feel that we can start believing that something actually happened <laughs> because we've been told about it several times that we now start visualizing it in our own minds as something that's happened. But anyway, memory, is she a credible narrator? I, I felt yes and no, because with the first part of the book, she's talking about her childhood. And later on in the book, you realise that although her memory may be accurate or reasonably accurate, her understanding of what actually took place, her perception may not have been, she may not fully have comprehended what she was seeing. So her interpretation, because she's a child, leads her memory down a certain path that isn't necessarily the right path. So she's misunderstood certain things when we're talking about the sale of a child and all the rest. Uh -huh. I'm not saying it wouldn't happen, but what she felt was a sale wasn't actually a sale when she had a more rounded view of what had happened. So... You see, okay, fine. She's a child and she's interpreted the transaction, mm -hmm. transaction in inverted commas, as a sale. But I also wonder whether or not she's in denial, or whether or not she's actually blocked the fact that she's left her family to go and live with this man, she's actually blocked some of the things that happened out because doesn't Lloyd write her a letter and she doesn't open it? Yeah. Just wondering whether that's one, yeah. willful, her, her memory and the things that she re recollects. So I'm wondering whether or not there's, she's choosing to recollect something and to believe some things and choosing not to believe other things. Is that because of the trauma of the way in which she left her biological parents? could be and her sibling it could be because you know she's uprooted from everything that she knows to go and yes. live in summer madness and that and, and and to come and live in number one in a place where everybody's a stranger but then number two where actually you have someone there who doesn't exactly like you yes lloyd was very nice to her and you know lloyd was a perfect parent but lloyd's sister wasn't exactly very welcoming mm. Mm. but lloyd's sister wasn't living with lloyd was she uh, no, but no. He, he always would come around. Yeah, yeah, with a girlfriend for him. I thought she was as I didn't. I thought she was reasonably accurate as far as as far as we could judge. But obviously, the things she, the way she recollected childhood things, even there's one place where she said it's like the Greek word for memory, which I've forgotten that Lloyd called her. Mm -hmm. that she didn't understand it when he was, but now kind of she now realized he was making it was a sort of a joke a term of endearment sorry yeah yes it's a term kind, of endearment. Kind, kind of but what you're saying about the trauma i thought the traumas you know of her she didn't know that her mother had tried to drown her but she was having these nightmares and things like that i think those were the traumas that seemed to be affecting her mm. more but, but at the same time, her, under her understanding of how she had landed up at Summer Madness, I felt that that, because she hadn't got the full picture 
but she did understand that her parents, for whatever reason, even though it was out of love and for her safety and for her to continue to live, that her father arranged for her to go and live elsewhere uh, to be away from her mother. But she didn't understand that as a child. So in terms of, you know, her child's worldview, I guess that would have been traumatic. Yeah, and mm. that yeah. would affect a child as well, just being uprooted and then being taken to completely somewhere alien. I think to, to say the child's parents don't love the child, that's the way a child would probably interpret it. Why has yeah. it sent away? What have I yeah. done wrong? But don't you think that she's regarding her relationship with Lloyd, although it, later on in the book it sort of says about how, you know, she loved him as in a fatherly way, but she seemed quite detached to me. And could that be like after her parents, you know, in her mind as a child, probably rejecting her? Her mother always kind of rejected her, didn't she? Because her mother couldn't come to terms with her albinoism. So whether, I think that's how I, I see it as manifesting, the way she seems very detached about the things that happen later on. But at the same time, I guess, living with Lloyd, the fact that her albinoism caused her health problems, that was fully addressed, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So that the, the, the lack of pigmentation was no longer such an issue with her, to the extent that when she went to prison, the guards were saying, oh, you know, you look good for, for an albino, you look good, you know, you yeah. take care of yourself, looking after business, that kind of thing. But I don't think her mother could have come to terms with it, even if she'd seen her looking, you know, healthy. I don't think that would have made a difference to the mother, was it? The, the yeah. pigmentation itself was easy. I was going to say about the letter, mm-hmm. I sort of, that she didn't read, I felt that was a little bit artificial, like the author doing that, because... If she'd read it then, it would have altered the rest of the book, wouldn't it? That's true. So, it would have finished the story like, off, possibly. Yeah. So, yeah. so you think it was just a technique or a device to prolong the story? Possibly, I think so. It would have been. It would have rounded it off a bit quicker, definitely, because she would have known what had happened. So, mm. yeah, because I didn't really... And I get that she's upset, but I would have still been quite intrigued to read the letter of I Were Her and the fact that she just... I can't remember what she did with it. Did she throw it away or something i was quite surprised because that's basically everything that you've been wondering what's happened is in there and you just refuse to read it i don't know she just wanted to hold on to what she thought was her truth but yeah i would have i would have read it about her even if it was a week months later but she, the way she dismissed it i definitely think it was it might have been a technique within from the author and do you think that that's the fact that she just is completely dismissed the letter? It sort of signifies the detached nature of her relationship with Lloyd. Because even after his death, she really doesn't feel any remorse for him dying. Or better still, for when after, after he was in prison, she didn't feel any remorse then either, did she? Would, would she be more that? guilt though? Yeah, no. she felt something. No, or... I, I don't know. I felt that she just didn't because she didn't even talk about it. She didn't even apologize. Maybe that's why, because she felt so guilty she could. I mean, if I've been in the wrong that badly and I can't, maybe she just didn't want to say sorry, possibly. That might have been her way of dealing with it. I don't know. I felt like she said she felt a bit of guilt, maybe when, like, years when she came back. I, yeah, I don't know. If she, I just think maybe she struggled to say anything to him. And he didn't, he's not one to be confrontational. So, you know, she just took advantage of that, I think. And, and at that time, she, he, when he had just come out of prison, I mean, she's, she's been in uh, Zimbabwe all her life. She's not been exposed to other people's views about gay life and rights and so on. But when she comes back and she's travelled the world and everything, yeah. she's, no, she's no doubt formed a different view of you know, the, the people's sexual rights and so on, mm. where she was probably still struggling to come to terms with what she'd witnessed with Lloyd. Um, I didn't think it was because the, you know, Lloyd was gay and she recognised that Lloyd was gay. I felt it was more spite, as yeah. in, you know, Lloyd has taken my lover away, that kind of thing. Mm. Mm. I felt she was shocked to realise that he was gay. I think that, but I don't think she would have been, I don't know if she still would have behaved the same way and called the police or whatever if it wasn't no, the guy that she yeah. that she liked, yeah. So. Yeah, she was getting revenge a bit as well, wasn't she? Yes, yeah. that's true. Yeah. 
Yeah. So ab- about his death, she seems, well, I mean, okay, she, I don't want to give the story away, but she seems unrepentant and actually just nonchalant about it. But it wasn't her fault, was it? Why should she be repentant? Or yeah, you think because he couldn't take a partner after what had happened, he'd be too scared to have a partner? You think that's why she should have remorse? Well, well, she, for a start, she wouldn't be where... She, she wouldn't have been in prison. I, I doubt very much had she died then... <laughs> had she did, had she not done what she did after she found him. But wasn't she protecting him? I took it she was being very protective of him. His reputation, his name. Yeah. yeah. She didn't want people to know how he died, that it'd be a huge scandal and disgraceful and so on. So you saw it more as a protective rather than... Oh, yeah. But well, she could have protected him to... i giving too much away. She still could have protected him without doing as much as she did. Move like you know, she could have protected him in the room. If that makes sense, just moved a few things around, and then that would be it. That everything else, mm-hmm. it was just a, a, a lot, and I didn't understand why that that happened. I think, yeah, I understand that she wanted to protect him, but that was something else. I don't understand why she went through all of that. I would say I thought she could have protected him by simply calling his sister yeah. and saying, "Look, this, you know, you need to come over. You need to come over now." Look at your brother. What can we do? You know, my, because- my thing is, sorry, I don't trust her. I don't know what it is, but because she's yeah. never liked memory, I don't trust her. And I don't know what she would. Have, I don't know. I just feel like she would have done something to dump her in and still accuse memory of being involved somehow. I'm not sure. But I, yeah, there's something about that woman that I don't think memory could have you know, she didn't do anything, but she wouldn't have gotten away with it. Somehow she would have put her at fault. How about Honestly, the I think too badly of people. <laughs> I was just going to say, how about then calling the neighbour that just lived down the road? The yeah. one that, whose horses she used to ride. That's yeah. true. Oh, a few options. Yeah, yeah. I don't think she necessarily but, needed to take the action that she actually did. Perhaps not, but you could imagine it being a bit of panic, yeah. couldn't you? Because it's an extraordinary thing to come home and discover, isn't it, really? Mm. It is. And <laughs> moving away from Lloyd and um, uh, his death, um, the family scenes, the family scenes when she's describing her mother and her sisters and brother, for me, I think they were the most touching, especially when the father and then do find out actually what's really what's wrong with the mother. I found those scenes really touching and affecting. Mm-hmm. I just wondered what you guys thought about that. Yeah, very much. I think especially like after the little girl Moby's death mm-hmm. and father, he obviously he feels like he's failed. He's been trying to be on guard really with the children, hasn't he, over the years? And, and he's sort of sunk into depression. And there's that little bit where she says she made him egg and tea or something. She made yeah. him some sort of breakfast and took it to him. And he thanked her, but he didn't actually touch it. And then she wanted to take it to the mother and the mother was asleep. And yeah, it's it's very touching. And you feel for the father so much. I mean, the mother obviously is also a very distressed woman, but you feel for the father. He's been trying so hard and failed. The father's a saint. Yeah, but also, well, the father is a saint, but then at the same time, I just, I was always wondering why, and he probably can't help yourself, but you he, he kept having children. And also, I mean, you had this whole it's thing about the God, this whole thing about <laughs> the Gossi, right? So, you know, you have all of that hanging over you, and but you still keep having children. I mean, surely in the 80s, there were things that you could do. <laughs> yes, he was a saint. And he, I mean, he was a good man. I mean, I, I thought he was a really good man. And I, th- I think he really tried. I mean, sticking by his wife where some men would have just upped and gone. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I wanted to ask is religion, both spirituality and Christianity. And I just wondered what you thought, how that affected the society in which they lived. Because there was a lot of going to different churches. And I just wondered how, what impact or what effect do you think the religion had on, especially the mother? I felt it had a fundamental impact on her and her search for a solution to the way she felt 
and her mental health problems, you know, going from church to church and seeing some of the charlatans at the church trying to take advantage. And even the way in which um, memory and the, the trauma of, I mean, it's like a double trauma, I guess, the trauma of trying to remember why she has this fear of drowning mm. on the one hand, because of what had happened to her before she could remember when her mother tried to kill her. But on the other hand, when the, the preacher man was trying to baptize her and, you know, kind of perform an exorcism of some sort, you know, if not for her father saving her, he may well have drowned her for all we know, because she refused to recant and <laughs> declare that she was against the devil and accept Jesus and all the rest of it. Mm. So, I mean, religion runs through, even the guards as well. You know, the guards wouldn't say that they were abusing their power, that they were tyrannical. They'd simply say that, no, they were trying to reform, I guess, their, their, their inmates, even though it was, it was something else that really that was going on. How but at the same time, I think with really the father, though, the father, the way in which he actually met his wife, she was already the wife of another man. Yeah. And so if you're going to use religion, I guess, although I don't think he was that religious, you might argue the fact that, well, you reap what you sow. She was already another man's wife. Why did you take away another yeah. man's wife? It's all about reaping what you, well, not what you sow, <laughs> but reaping the the past, isn't it? Because of the Ngozi spirit as well. It's mm. not their sin, but it's the sins of their forefathers coming to visit them. So whichever way they go, whether they go with tradition or they go with the Christian church, they're kind of caught, aren't they? So, no way. Yeah. Sorry, Annette, you were... Oh, no, I just agree. I felt also did... If, I think if it was just him bringing up the, the kids alone, it wouldn't have been a such a central part of their life. I don't think he was as religious. And then also I do think another reason why he had to stay with her is because... I mean, this is sort of, yeah, they're not consequences isn't the right word, but it was another man's wife. And maybe that's partly why he also feels like, you know, I just have to stick with her. So, yeah. Um, and yeah, and I also just thought about, especially with the guards, that it wasn't until peop uh, some of them started using the proverbs and psalms as extra paper for the toilet that they then got extra <laughs> toilet tissue. <laughs> like if it wasn't for that, you know, they wouldn't have got any. <laughs> so yeah, it, it popped up in lots of different in, um, aspects of the book, definitely. And it, even at the end, the sister, it turns out she's become a nun, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. There was a lot of religion in it. And just a couple of you mentioned the prison and the prison guards. Ty, well, earlier on, you mentioned humour. And I found the scenes in the prison, I think, to be the funniest. Yeah. Because, yeah, yeah, yeah very... <laughs> such funny things. And, and the prisoners themselves, the women, I like the way they just all defied the guards. I like their st I liked hearing their stories as to why they were in prison in the first place. And I just found some of the scenes really humorous. I mean, yeah. you're not supposed to laugh at you know, someone in prison, <laughs> but actually I just thought they were really funny. And that's mm -hmm. what she says somewhere, doesn't she? That you wouldn't have imagined how much laughter there was in prison. Mm -hmm. And and I like the scene where they were rehearsing how... Yeah. The, the mock trials and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that was quite fun. <laughs> but it's so true, though, isn't it? When you really think about it, because it's like gaming the judiciary system or the judicial system, because you know that it's stacked against you. So you have to have some form of insight in order to try and make it work for you, mm -hmm. you know, to work with what is being presented to you. You know that it's stacked against you, so you're trying to even things out a little bit. But, but it's the way in which they all had their own opinion as to, you know, this is what you should do to get the outcome that you're seeking. That was hilarious. It's the, it's the way they went about it. And the other fact that I actually found really funny was when the, I think one of the religious, a woman from one of the religious orders came to visit a memory. So that one liner was just, uh, it was a showstopper, that one liner. <laughs> that was absolutely hilarious. And testament to the author for actually being, um, setting the book in such a scenario. And actually it's still being really, really funny. Yeah. And I enjoyed that part of it. Going back to the characters, how do you think that they changed? Or if at all, do you think that they changed throughout the story? And did your opinion of them change, change as well? To be honest, a lot of the prison characters, I, I felt as if the whole idea of prison being punishment or reform, reform, reformation wasn't really on the cards for them. It's just like, OK, we're going to do our time. We're going to get through this. And when we get out, we'll learn from the mistakes that we made, we made 
that landed us here in the first place, as in, I'm going to do what I'm going to do, but I'm simply not going to get caught. That's all it yeah. is. I mean, I love the woman, the woman with the diesel. She convinced these ministers and people that she could make diesel flow out of a rock. I just love the idea that she could convince these kind of high status, highly educated ministers and other people. And she convinced them mm. because they wanted to be fooled. They wanted yeah. to believe. I just love that idea. It was just, it was fantastic. Brilliant. So I felt a lot of the prisoners were really not going to change. And in some ways, it's like, why should I change? What have I really done wrong? You know, I live in a society that is kind of upside down. It's just that because of my position in this society, I am judged in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And as a result, society now wants to punish me. They say I should, my liberty should be taken away from me. And these tin pot um, guards should just rule over me for a certain <laughs> period of time. Okay, fine. But when I get through all this, I'm going to just come back better, you know, faster, harder, bigger, stronger, you know. <laughs> No reformation at all. None whatsoever. None. What is there to reform? But it's, yeah, I mean, I think, as you said, it is the society that they live in. I mean, they did. I mean, what other options did they have? Yeah. If, if when they came out, it's not as if, you know, they had jobs waiting for them or had, you know, families that would be helping them out. They didn't have any other options but to go back to what they'd, what they'd done before. I felt the stories of the, the back stories of the different women prisoners was, it was really interesting. It sort of gives you, it was the way the author gives you little glimpses of Zimbabwean life for these different women who are generally quite poor and they've been married in various circumstances. And I can't remember all the stories now, but I thought it was like, it was a good way of sort of showing a cross section people from that and there were one or two the lady who'd been doing all the confidence tricks doing and everything somebody was a bit better off but most of them were not very well off <laughs> and the woman that the woman that created the ngo and the way in which she was saying you know there's certain catchphrases that's all you need to do you know you have to yeah, yeah the girl <laughs> child yeah the girl <laughs> child i just i was laughing out loud thinking yeah this is it. i've forgotten this is it. that these women are not powerless don't think that they're powerless they have yeah. agency just because they're of a certain class or maybe educational background or whatever. If circumstances were different, some of these women would be CEOs and some of these women would be members of parliament and all the rest. It's just circumstances that hasn't given them the opportunities. That's all it is. Oh, yeah. definitely. And they were using their creativity in the best way that they could. Exactly. I think they kind of enjoyed they did kind of get a thrill out of it. I mean, if you kind of enjoyed what you're doing, you're relatively good at what they were doing. Obviously, they got caught. But still, like you said, Tyra, just leave and do bigger and better. So, I mean, <laughs> there was, yes, they could change maybe. But, like, you know, there's no, there is no really any kind of reform programs or anything going on in the prisons. They weren't getting degrees or learning a new language or whatever it might be. They're not setting you up to do better when you leave. So at the same time, what can you do? You haven't left a clip of new skills necessarily. So, yeah, but it was it was still very funny. Just that reading prison more prison than bad stories. It's almost as if you say the prison was a school and people were learning certain things and honing their skills that they already yes. had. So, you know, kind of take the game to the next level. Exactly. Just think about what you did wrong and then try to just fix it. That's it. A lot of the prisoners had quite high status amongst themselves, didn't they? You know, it's like the gossip would go around about, oh, this is the woman that did X, Y, and Z. She's now coming to the prison. So they hold some of the prisoners yeah. in high regard amongst themselves. And even some of the, the prison guards, they look up to the prisoners. I mean, look at memory. The fact that she's so well educated and yeah. then they want their, as in the, the prison guards' children, they want the children to do better than the prison guards. Mm -hmm. So they're using memory to act like a private tutor, aren't they? to help the children pass certain um, educational examinations to get into good schools and so on and so forth. And just coming back to the fact that memory was Albino, and do you think that the author writing about her and making her the central character would at all change the views um, of Africans, at least certain African countries, of how they treat Albinos and what they think of Albinos? I think it will help. How much do you think that book is going to get read in Zimbabwe by ordinary Zimbabweans, though, for oh. example? I don't know. I don't know what the book scene is like in Zimbabwe, but I do know that in places like Uganda and Kenya, books like these, people don't buy them. People just, um, unfortunately, make illegal copies 
and they're so <laughs> they're sold on the street for very they exchange hands for very little money. So people do read, well, but just put like yeah. copies. I'm sure some people do read in Zimbabwe as well, but the people I know, not particularly, I would say, not unless they're trying to do an exam. Mm. And I don't think I'm not saying nobody reads. Of course they do, and the more better off people are, the more likely they are to read. But I still don't think that book is going to have a massive circulation in Zimbabwe amongst the people who might still be the ones who are the more prejudiced against albinoism. Because I don't think it, I don't know about in the 80s, but I don't think it's such a big deal in Zimbabwe as it is in Tanzania. Mm, where so uh, in Tanzania is a lot more problems for albinos really you know in sense of the sort of witchcraft things and so on but i see it as broader though than just zimbabwe or, or just east africa I, I see it as the whole continent of africa because i mean bear in mind that for most of africa well maybe not most at least sub-saharan africa people tend to be of a darker hue mm. northern africa may be you know arab population and all that maybe you're lighter but there is that cultural issue of albinism and what it represents. So I think it goes away towards at least starting a conversation or continuing a conversation about people's changed mindset. You know, there was a time, wasn't there, in, in East Nigeria where to have twins was seen as something very bad and mm. you'd leave the twins in the bush to die because the twins would bring misfortune on the family. That changed over time. Mm. So things can change. I mean, culture can change over time. The more people are exposed to new ways of thinking, the more conversation there is about what does it mean to be an albino, then these things change. Mm. I do think in, I mean, just what I observed, it just happened, I was last in Zimbabwe in 2018, and I happened to see this young girl who was albino, looking extremely trendy and well turned out, walking down with her boyfriend, and who was normal skin pigmentation. And I, w I was surprised because I can remember back in the 80s how rough people looked. Not that anyone was that I could observe was doing anything to them, just they just looked very unhealthy and like they were having very uncomfortable time with their skin and, you know, the effects of the sun on it. And I just thought, well, at least for some people, there's been quite a... Um, an improvement, really. And unfortunately, we do have about four minutes left. So oh, wow. Four minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. If we go around just saying out of five, summary of the book, basically, and then a score out of five. So if I could start with you, Annette. I don't know. I gave it before, but I think, you know, maybe three and a half. Um, yeah, it was a good book. And yeah, really interesting just because it's set in a prison and main character has albinism so that was different for me as well but I think it was a slow start it took a while to get to the point where I wanted it to and yeah I'm not sure like I, said, I didn't I think I'm saying I didn't love it but it was it was a good book it's just quite a slow start for me and I don't know how much I liked the going back and forth I, I got used to it but I wasn't sure how much I I wanted that within within the book so so yeah three and a half stars for me but I would recommend it cool and Katrina um, oh, I give it a four. I enjoyed it a lot. I mean, I don't think it is perfect in its structure mm -hmm. and so on like that. But because I was enjoying the story, I didn't mind just read it to find out what happens. You know, it didn't bother me at all. And how about you, Dale? I'm like Katrina. I'll give it a four. I really did enjoy it. I, I do like to enjoy the cover of a book as well. And I enjoyed the cover of this. I like the way, I mean, yes, it was a slow start, but that didn't bother me. I, I was fine with that. But I like the way by the time we got to um, part three and the prison, a lot of things started to fall into place. And a lot of things that I hadn't fully grasped, I realized that I hadn't fully grasped and why. So there was a lot of resolution towards the end. The, the theme of humor throughout the whole thing, that really worked for me because mm -hmm. I, I love the way that even though it's set to a large extent in a prison, there's humour throughout. So, you know, beyond just the circumstances that one finds oneself in, there can still be joy. So, yes, I, li I liked it. Cool. And I would round off with a 3.5. I think like Annette, I just found it slow to begin with. The humour really kept 
what made it for me. I thought it was so funny um, in part. Um, I just wish she was it had been funnier at the beginning as well. <laughs> and I, I like the fact that it's telling a story that you don't read very often. It's, the main character has features that you don't read about very often. So I like that about it. And I like the descriptiveness. As I said earlier, it just made me feel that I was in Zimbabwe uh, as I was reading it. So I really do like that element of it. So just time for me to say thank you so much, guys. Um, thank you, too. Thank you. I think it was a really good conversation and discussion. I think this one was actually a bit, a bit, a bit more organized than the other one. <laughs> Have a good weekend. Thank you so you much. Too. Have a, Have a good one. Yes. Yeah. Bye. And thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this or any of our other episodes, please like, share or subscribe on Spotify, YouTube and Apple Podcasts. Till next time. Goodbye.